All right, so we're live here with John Buck and Stephen Dillon, and I've uh, linked a description to Stephen's website and book that he's published um, in the links of the description of the video, so you want to check that out. And then um, we're just going to be kind of exploring some of his ideas, and then, um, yeah, so just take it away. Um, Stephen, if you want to introduce yourself or share whatever, and then we'll get going on the discussion. Sure. Uh, I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you for having me on. And thank you, John, for talking with me. I've listened to your debates and you seem like a really interesting mind and uh, very well reversed and especially the analytic side of things. So I'm excited. Um, I, for those who have never heard of me, uh, I'm not like a big deal or anything. Uh, my name is Stephen Dillon. Uh, I'm a polytheist, pagan philosopher, apologist, author. Um, I've been a polytheist for about 10 years now, well, a little over. Uh, I public, published a couple books, got a couple articles. Uh, I run that uh, blog website that's linked in the description. Uh, my most recent book uh, is Polytheism, A Platonic Approach. And that was published uh, last August, actually. And um, yeah, I don't, I don't claim or pretend to be anything special. Uh, I'm just a, a huge fan of the philosophy of religion. And my particular story has taken me in this direction, which I found is um, not discussed at all in, um, among philosophers and even the, the philosophy of religion crowd. So um, my, my work definitely tries to popularize polytheism and paganism. Um, but there's another side to it where I actually try to um, research and develop pagan ideas and polytheist ideas. So instead of popularizing it, I'm actually doing philosophy, you know. Um, but this la this latest book uh, is, is definitely a, an attempt to translate into today's language these ancient ideas from the Neoplatonists. So. Yeah, sweet. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, no, it's, it's so cool. Like, you uh, are, like, in this perfect fit with, like, Caleb and I, who are also not, like, actual professional philosophers or anything, just people who, like, enjoy it as a hobby. But you actually have published work, so at least good on you for that. <laughs> so, uh, but, yeah, no, uh, yeah, we've interacted on Twitter, and I, I, I find that your sort of, like, approach to philosophy is very interesting. And I, and I really great, uh, I greatly appreciate how, like, like, going through the book and, uh, there's a lot, it's a, this wonderful blend between like very classical thought with like Parmenides and yeah, the Platonist, uh, even prior to, uh, like the modern sort of philosophy or anything like that, as well as sort of like working in and, and trying to understand these sorts of positions from within a very analytic systematic sort of framework. So I really appreciate that sort of like blend between those two ways, approaches to the world and like trying to really integrate the, the two. So, and it also not being too, too long either. It's a very, yeah. very slim book, very easy to sort of digest and get into. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I, I have always thought I don't want to waste people's time and I don't like to waffle on. So I'll generally write this big old manuscript and I just keep condensing it until I was actually toying around with an idea earlier of just, of just publishing a book with just arguments for polytheism, just the mm -hmm. argument, some brief, you know, the necessary unpacking of the premises, but then just leaving it at that because that's my style. You know, I don't like to waffle yeah, on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cut out all the fluff. Let's just get yeah. straight to the dilemma. Yeah, yeah. I like exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, do you want to sort of like just sort of lay out your general approach and sort of like coming to polytheism as a sort of like philosophical worldview? And then we can sort of discuss further like how that connects it. Yeah. How we'll, we'll engage. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Uh, so, let me do this in two parts then. The first is, how I actually came to polytheism mm -hmm. intellectually and then where I'm at right now, because I view them differently. Mm -hmm. uh, so at the time I was actually a Catholic seminarian. I was going to be a priest. Um, and I went through a bunch of stuff I don't need to uh, delve into now, but essentially I started to question a lot of things uh, for the first time uh, because I'd, I'd gone so long as a Catholic, but I never really investigated it. So for the first time I found myself um, engaging with apologetics, philosophy, uh, and that sort of stuff. And uh, the result of that was me having to, to step out of commitment to Catholicism, to Christianity, to even theism for a while. And um, it was, it was a, a painful time in my life because I really um, had to let go of some, some cherished beliefs. 
uh, but it was also life changing in that I um, fell in love with philosophy, wherever that led me. And I, I didn't care if it was naturalism or if it was Roman Catholicism again, whatever it was, you know, but in, in that pursuit um, of trying to reconstruct this worldview that I just obliterated, I realized that there hadn't really been anything published on polytheism. So I, I kind of scoured through the literature as best I could, you know, with my means. And um, I found like the odd article uh, covering like, you know, philo attempts to philosophically construct a polytheism. And they seemed very abstract to me. It didn't seem like anybody had done anything on this, really. So I saw this gap, not only in the literature, but also in my own journey. I'm like, well, I can't just reason my way to naturalism or to um, monotheism without even considering polytheism. So what is the issue here? Like, why why does nobody take this seriously? And I, like I said, I couldn't really find anything on it. There was just um, throwaway remarks like Swinburne, for example, or even Oppie will say things like it's... Um, more complicated. It's not as simple. So I was like, okay, Occam's razor, I got it. Um, so my, my initial phase into polytheism was realizing that um, I didn't have any reasons to reject this view. And the more I looked into the phenomena of religious experience, the more I became persuaded that polytheism was the best explanation for that. So that was my initial entrance into polytheism. It was intellectual. I didn't have any religious experience myself. But I, I had this idea that um, more or less, if monotheism is true, there's only one God. And that means that all the diverse religious experiences that are taking place are unreliable because they're, they're incorrectly telling people that they're perceiving deities that don't exist. So I, so I reason that if monotheism is true, religious ex experience is unreliable. But I think it's, it's reliable. I think it's heretical, uh, at least... And until, you know, I have good reason to think otherwise. So that was my initial entrance. Uh, then, as a polytheist, I uh, began to try to incorporate Thomism into paganism. So I created this thing called scholastic paganism, which I got a lot of shit for. Sorry, pardon my French, but I really did. Um, and the idea was Thomas Aquinas baptized Aristotle. So I wanted to enchant Aquinas, so to speak. And I recognize that just as Aristotelianism um, was available to Muslims, Jews, Christians, whoever, so too is Thomism available for non-Catholics, non-Christians, because it's a philosophical system. I don't have to be Christian even to accept hylomorphic dualism, for example. So I tried to um, develop a rigorous um, Thomism for paganism. So I would analyze things like witchcraft or uh, reincarnation or polytheism in terms of Thomistic doctrines to whatever degree of success. I'll leave that to others to say. But um, one thing that uh, I never let go of, even all these years since I was a Catholic, was the idea that there was uh, one first principle. There was one capital G God so that the only way I could systematize polytheism as a Thomist or even as uh, just an analytic philosopher was to postulate one overarching principle and then a sort of committee of smaller deities. And then let's like on Thomism, for example, I, I reason that everything is an imitation of God. So what imitates God qua God are the gods. Just as intellect imitates God qua intellectual, uh, the will into imit you know what I mean, sorry. <laughs> but the, I, I reason that the gods were the imitations of God qua God. Um, and that was the biggest turning point for me in my life so far was realizing that there was another way to look at this. It was a Copernican revolution for me. Uh, I had gone all these years thinking that I had to reinvent the wheel as a polytheist. And I was, I thought I was doing this groundbreaking work and all this and I encountered someone named Dr. Edward Butler, who had a prolific body of um, articles, books, lectures on something he called polycentricity. And he is a um, scholar of Platonism, uh, especially with Proclus and the, the later Platonists. And what I found through talking with him and reading his literature was that the 
Platonic academies developed a system um, that placed the gods at the top, so to speak. So instead of having one god with lowercase gods around him, uh, the Platonists postulated that there were many gods at the top. And I, that was mind-blowing to me because, like I said, I was a Thomist at that, at that point in time. So for me, to postulate more than one god was like a confusion. You know what I mean? You can't have more than one of this. It doesn't make sense for reasons we can get into later. But um, at that point in my life, I discovered that there was already in existence a wholly fleshed out polytheist worldview. So I didn't have to reinvent the wheel anymore. And I also discovered that there was a whole new way of looking at it. And that was so life changing to me that I had to sort of document my journey and the reasons that I had developed this new view. And that's where this, this latest book came from. This latest book is a presentation of Neoplatonism, essentially, to people. Um, and I've tried to translate those the terms that are honestly impenetrable to us today into more like understandable, digestible terms. Um, wow, I talked a lot there. I don't know if that... <laughs> No, no, no. Yeah, it's always great. Yeah. And I do like how you sort of split up the two between like where you're at now and where you're sort of thinking about like what the best defenses are for this view versus how you've sort of gotten into it. Because I think that's sort of like a lot of people's sort of like journeys anywhere intellectually is going to be coming partially from like, okay, what is my historical sort of like way I came into this position? And mm -hmm. what are my defenses that I have it now? Because it may be the case that I like, I was initially convinced by like bad arguments and then later like, well, maybe there's something to this argument that <laughs> could be elaborated, but it's, <laughs> it just needs to be mm -hmm. worked out, fleshed out a little bit better. But yeah, I do appreciate that. Um, just for anybody who's, who's watching, mm -hmm. could you maybe like a lot, um, sort of articulate kind of like what you mean by polytheism, because I'm sure that there's many people who have in their minds this sort of like folk notion of polytheism that's maybe something like, oh, there's all these super beings that maybe exist in some sort of realm above our realm that are sometimes able to like pop down and sort of interact with the world, or maybe from their sort of like higher realm, they're, they're able to sort of like change the, 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 the winds of the lower realm in some ways and uh but like no uh, how at least uh, as i'm getting from you, you you're wanting to flesh out polytheism with the, the capital g god but in plural form and so uh yeah can you sort of articulate like how you understood understand the gods yeah absolutely uh so i used to think that um there were three ways to look at theism as, as far as the truth of it not in the knowledge of it. You had polytheism, monotheism, and atheism. And I thought the difference between these was just uh, quantity. It was just numerical. One said there was one God, one said there was no God, and one said there were many gods, which I think is deliberately left um, ambiguous. Many could be two, many could be three, many could be four, whatever. But I, I used to think that was how to um, divide up the logical space, so to speak. And then you could accord different initial probabilities. You could um, analyze evidence in those terms. And uh, what I came to view now is that polytheism does say it is the proposition that there are many gods, but I don't think it is a difference of number anymore. I think that the difference between polytheism and monotheism and atheism is one of the fundamental structure of reality. I think that uh, as readers of that book may have noticed that uh, on monotheism and atheism, it seems to me, reality converges into one point. For monotheists, that's God. For atheists, that could be nature, that could be anything, whatever it is. But they agree in this fundamental structure of reality. Whereas on polytheism, it doesn't, reality doesn't converge on, on one point alone. It converges on each God, which is hard to explain. And I'm not going to try to condense that right now. But um, I would say in answer to your question, on the one hand, I think that polytheism is the proposition that there are many gods. And on the other hand, that my view of what a God is has changed to such an extent that I don't think, I think the difference between polytheism and monotheism and atheism is way bigger than um, philosophers of religion realize. Uh, but to, to get a little bit more clear, and uh, I'm sorry I'm being 
um, terrible at this, but no, no, this is great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I initially in about 2015, I proposed a threefold criteria for what it is to be a God. And I stated that these were not necessary conditions, but that they were sufficient. And I said something like a disembodied consciousness, um, and like a, a powerful degree of awe, like they had to inspire awe. So I proposed like a threefold condition. And that was based on on a survey of the literature, basically. Like, what are people they, they they're talking about these things called gods? What are they talking about? So I just kind of abstracted these three sufficient conditions. But now, um, I'm I'm more in line with the Platonists, and I think that a god is simply um, a pure individual, a pure individual, someone who does not. Um, who is not composed of features and properties that they participate in. There's nothing more general or bigger than them. It's just them. It's like, uh, I talk in the book about the difference between a subject and a predicate. So in, in a proposition, it's made of a subject and a predicate. What happens when you take the predicate out of the picture and you just think about the subject? Well, technically it's indescribable or what I call ineffable. That's what I think a God is. A God is a subject, qua subject, pure. Um, before being, so to speak, before the categories, before space time, before, you know, I'm using this term, um, metaphorically, obviously, but, uh, they're just pure individuals, almost like, I don't know if you guys have ever thought about philosophical atoms, mm -hmm. something so simple, it cannot be divided. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's, it's analogous to that. And there's in, in seriously important differences that I would get into. But for the purposes of illustration, I would say you could think of a God as like a philosophical atom. They're, they're just supremely, unsurpassably, maximally unique. Right. Uh, like, I know at least maybe one way to sort of contrast, let's say, creatures from the gods could be that, like, in regards to, like, all of us three here, all of us are human, but neither one of no, no no single one of us like exhausts the the fullness of humanity within themselves. So like John is human, but John is not humanity, and Stephen is human, but Stephen is not humanity. Like the very uh, the predicate of humanity it, it includes multitudes, but perhaps at least for in the case of the gods, the the the. I guess the the individual, the subject themselves, exhausts the entirety of that uh nature i guess you could say so yep. there's for each god there is a sort of like full and complete nature such that no other thing could participate within that or at least could not be like some component of that maybe yes um however however we chalk that up it would just be that the god comes first mm -hmm. and so there's a, there's a really interesting contrast i've been trying to draw on twitter i guess that's where i do a lot of stuff but between the, the platonic view of divine simplicity and the classical theist view of divine simplicity. And on the classical theist view, um, for a lot of different reasons, to be simple is to be less, is to have, have less. So it's reductionary. It's, um, I don't have properties. I don't have these. But on the platonic view, it's different. It's to have more. So uh, maybe I can get into the difference between a, a constitutive model and a causal model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that would be good. Okay. So one of the interesting things about Neoplatonism is it, it is focused on all of reality. So um, the classical theists and after them, the, um, the more modern types of theists, they focus on cosmological data. They focus on experiential data. They focus on, on data and they reason from effect to cause. But the Neoplatonists reason more mariologically. So they looked at all of reality and they tried to explain it, the whole thing, not just the beginning of the universe, not just the fine tuning of the initial constants, not just, you know, um, moral features. They wanted to explain the totality of all things. So they, in Platonic fashion, uh, they wanted to explain the many with reference to a one. It's the problem of the one and the many. So just as um, you have um, a plurality of red things that participate in redness, you have a plurality of physical things that have some physical um, center that they all participate in. Just as you have all, you know what I mean? There's different um, generalities of pluralities. They went to the maximum one. 
the totality of all things. And what they reasoned was Mariologically, um, that the the totality itself has to be the whole. If it's the totality of all things, there can't be anything outside of it. Not even a god. Not even number. There's nothing abstract or concrete. It doesn't matter. Everything is included in this grand, all-encompassing totality. So they reason the only unity this thing can have is itself. It is a whole. So they saw reality holistically, and um, they proceeded their their sort of what I guess we would call natural theology now was stratifying this grand totality. So they would say there is a layer of this grand totality that is intellectual. This is where intellect um, emerges on the scene, so to speak. And then there's a, a layer where soul emerges and then matter uh, at the very outside. They said there was oneness. They said oneness, the one that is the most general layer of anything the, the most fundamental way for a thing to be is to be one so they would say that even being itself um, has a unity has an individuality has an identity as being itself it's being itself rather than you know um, so unity for the platonists is the first principle they called it henos one in greek and it's we don't have a good english term for it it's frustrating to try to um to get a good explanation for it, but it's, it's like the integrity of being yourself. It's, it's it, a, do you think it might be similar to like the uh, scholastic term hexaity that's used by like uh SCOTUS, which is like the, the individualness. I think it's used some uh, referred to sometimes as the thisness of a subject. Mm -hmm. uh, so like that maybe could be like the term. I, I, I don't know. Yeah. It, it, that is a good corollary. I think I, okay. I thought about that too. The only, the only thing I, wonder is whether there is an inerrant um like a third person perspective in his concept like thisness mm. it's like i'm looking on the outside right, right. thisness but like but yeah it is this ineffable subject qua subject it's numerical um numerical uh identity basically so yeah uh, that, that that's how they proceeded they, they thought myriologically rather than causally so to speak and they found that the the most universal layer of all things there was this oneness and so that's the that's the layer where they talk about the gods at they don't talk about gods um in their philosophical capacity as like these um disembodied minds that kind of cruise around the universe and you know that that kind of more anthropomorphic conception they think of them as um this all-encompassing thing that all all ones partake of um so to speak. I actually forget where I was going with this, but that. No, no, it was at least good to bring up the sort of like sort of general approach that the platonic approach of like working from the one and then the way in and how mm -hmm. everything is within the one. And that's how like their understanding of like how to sort of separate or how, how to parse out the world is going to be in terms of first from the one and then working your way in. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay, so I have, I guess a sort of general sort of concern maybe from a sort of classical theistic understanding is that God, uh, as understood within classical theism, is going to generally be identified with existence itself. And the sort of like uh, reasoning to that position is going to be based off the fact that the certain things that we interact with in our world are things that could cease to exist and so we can sort of determine that oh because they could cease to exist their existence must not be something that is i guess intrinsic to them or essential to them or something like that so given that their 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 existence must come from something without and if you had a multitude of things that all derive their existence from something without themselves then you're going to have some sort of bad sort of circular regress of things like basically, Oh, I'm getting my dollar from Caleb. Who's getting his dollar from you and you're getting his dollar from me. And so like, there's going to be this sort of like need for something to actually be able to transfer that existence to something else that actually has existence within itself. And so at least as I understand Thomas, he identifies that with God, God being existence itself who has existence within himself and from whom, uh, all the existence of everything is going to be derived from. And so the concern or question I have is in going to be in regards to the gods. I would think that 
all of the gods themselves as well, if they do exist, are going to have that in common with each other. The fact that they exist, that they have the, the, their existence, I guess, is, is going to be in common with one another. And so from the, the fact that they have their existence in common, it, the platonic sort of reasoning is going to tell us that, oh, there must be something beyond both of those individuals from which they derive their existence from. And so that's from which we're going to sort of get this monocentric sort of view uh, of the world, the existence itself. And then from that sort of monocentric view, you could maybe have this sort of like lower layer of gods that are still, I guess, like fully encapsulating their nature, but are still deriving their existence from something other than themselves. So what are your sort of thoughts on that? Oh boy, yeah. Um... Let me start here. I would say that from a platonic perspective, what the what the classical theists are doing is technically philosophy of nature. Mm -hmm. So what they're talking about is like the unmoved mover, pure act. They're talking about the structure of nature, um, whereas the the Platonists will will distinguish what they're doing and they'll say we're talking about gods. We're not talking about um, how nature is structured, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So I think that will really um, I don't know, kind of upset Thomas especially because for them, they look at like um, theistic personalists and they're like, your, your God is way too, uh, you know, anthropomorphic. Right. Like we have being itself, assume I say subsistence. And then the Platonist comes and they're like, your God is a creature. You know, like, so it's kind of funny. There's always this bigger fish. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, but I would say okay. that. So the, the concern then is that for those that postulate, uh, that posit this sort of actus purus, that's going to, because it's going to be effable, it's going to be intelligible, that's going to tell us that, oh, this is a natural entity of some sort. Maybe it is how, like, how the natural world is sort of, like, bound to or something like that. But there's still going to be some bigger fish that, of the gods that are beyond that, that are ineffable, I guess. Uh, yes. So I would say that um, the whole idea here is that a god is, is ineffable. They are purely individual they're they're utterly unique so to mm -hmm. speak so when you have something that is effable in any respect like that um that's not a god it might it might participate in divinity in a very close proximity but um the Platonists want to talk about gods at the layer of of unity whereas they feel like thomas are talking about things at the layer of being so you said earlier that um the gods have existence in common this is really interesting uh, that for the Platonists, being comes after the gods. Hmm. So the way that I, I kind of wrap my head around this was um, the, the deepest sense of being real is being one. So that um, when, when, I, when I say as a Platonist that the gods transcend being, I don't mean they don't exist in the sense that they're a uh, figment of my imagination or that they're fictional or that they're anything like that. Uh, I mean that this common um, feature being um, is a product of them. So that even being itself has identity, it has unity, it partakes of oneness. And that's the level that the gods are at. So going back to like that philosophical atom, for example, if you had two utterly unique atoms, they're indivisible, they have nothing in common, so to speak. How do you, how do you talk about them in the plural? Uh, in the book, I talk about this when I interact with Thomas Aquinas, and I say that he accused polytheism of deep equivocity. And he said, basically, how do you talk about two gods? What do they have in common? You know, um, but from the Platonic perspective, what gods have in common is each other. So each god is a way of being all things, even themselves. So what, just keep in mind that we're talking about the whole of all things, the totality of all things, the the all the one. Um, this all encompassing totality is a God. And, and we stratify the layers of that God. Uh, so we might say Zeus is all things insofar as they're stable. So that is the, the Zeusaic um, cosmos. And then we might say Poseidon is all things insofar as they change. So that this, this all encompassing totality is each God in different perspectives. Um, yeah, I think that's hard to wrap your mind around. <laughs> <laughs>
No, and yeah, it's, it certainly is, <laughs> but it, it is an interesting perspective and, and one for, for one that I'm really appreciative of being able to have somebody as talented as yourself sort of being able to articulate for people. And so, yeah, trying to interact with as well. Um, yeah, okay. So is, in a sense, everything going to be somewhat intelligible insofar as we can say some things about it that are either going to be true or are going to be false? So like if we say that uh, the gods exist, that's going to be a, a true statement. So we, that's, uh, that's going to be something that um, there's going to be some aspect of reality regarding the gods that we'd be able to understand. And so for something to be truly ineffable, would that mean for nothing could be understood about it? Or like, how, how is it that you're wanting to sort of like, I guess, characterize ineffability? That's a good question. So in the, in the book, um, I talk about how poly, uh, theism is supposed to uh, posit something that transcends nature. Like some, there's something beyond nature. Nature isn't all there is to reality. And so that's where all this comes from. All this thinking about ineffability is that nature is sensible and intelligible. So to transcend nature is to transcend intelligibility. That's to be ineffable. And then I, I argue that ineffability is the negative way of describing individuality. It's like the subject qua subject without any predicates. Um, so, oh boy, where was I going with that? So then for something to be ineffable, it would, you, you could not like place a predicate upon it. That's not itself. Would that be uh, kind yes. of it? So like I can place the predicate of you that you're human and that's a predicate. That's not you yourself, but for, for a God, you couldn't say something like that because to say that a God is some predicate that's not itself is going to be, I guess, categorizing it and making it intelligible. Is that, I don't know, maybe where you're going. Right. So um, are the gods intelligible? Because we have to talk about them. This is something that the Platonists talked about too. They talked about how the one was ineffable. And then they were like, wait, how are we talking about this then if it's so ineffable? Yeah. Uh, Plotinus, or, uh, Plotinus talks about this. Proclus talks about this. And Damascius is really interesting. He was, he was one of the last Platonists. Uh, and he wrote this tome on first principles. And he goes into how um, the, the, the more abstract we think about this totality of all things, the less we can say until we get to this point where we can't say anything anymore. This pure unity is so individual. There's no predicates. There's no properties. There's nothing to say about it. It's just this St. John of Damascus. I'm just, no, no. It, okay. Okay. Yeah. It is sounding very similar to some of the mystical saints within, especially the Eastern tradition, but okay, carry on. Yep. So he, he, I, I I'm under the impression that the way the, the, late antique Platonists thought about this was um, the the more you go up the ladder of this hole, uh, you reach a, a ceiling, so to speak, where you look up and you see unity. Unity is the most fundamental layer of all things. And then beyond that, there's nothing to say anymore. It's just, it's pure individuality. It's like sheer who-ness. There's no universal properties, no intelligibility to talk about anymore. That's that's below us. So it's the center of all things is, is this pure, unique God, their ineffable character, which all things partake of. And in so doing, it gives them their individuality. It makes them to be ones, it makes them to be. Um, mm -hmm. so, so then within, let's say, the one at the sort of very outskirts of our understanding of uh, reality, W there would be like a multitude of subjects or individuals, but not necessarily a multitude of substances. Is that? So I, I believe that the way, the best way to articulate that is to say that the, the subject, the unity of all things is a God, but it's not any God in particular. And this is something I argue in the book is that monotheism is either trivially compatible with polytheism or it's materially equivalent with atheism. And the idea is that when you talk about something that's purely unique, you can't say they're the only one of anything because there's nothing for them to be the only one of. 
So when we when we think about that whole qua whole that the all as they called it, let's just say that Zeus, for example, we can't say Zeus is the only god, because at that level, there's nothing outside of the totality of all things for him to be the only one of. There's no broader category for him to be a member of or to exclusively um, instantiate. So what I would say is it's true of each God that um, they are the one. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of playing with terms here in the sense that if anybody is listening to this and they're familiar with um, Neoplatonism especially, they'll know that um, what I'm talking about is called the all, which is the, the totality of all things, that unity. Uh, the one, strictly speaking, oneness is purely negative uh, because the one cannot itself be a one, just like physicality cannot be physical or um, the same as any principle cannot be that of which it is a principle. Mm -hmm. So what oneness, strictly speaking, isn't anything. And this is something that Plato says in his uh, Parmenides. He says that the one neither is nor is one. So it's not a hypostatized being it's not um the one in its pure sense is just truly negative it's it's not two it's not physical it's not mental it's not those things so um like i said when you when you go up that scale of being for the platonist you get to that ceiling so to speak and that's where anything beyond it is just negative there's mm -hmm. nothing you can't say anything else so that's what i mean by the one is purely negative um but what we're talking about is the, the all, which is like, you, to, to continue with this weird illustration, it'd be like what you're standing on to see the ceiling. That That's the totality of all things. That's that's the God, so to speak. And um, a good way to understand how all things can be a God is to um, think of it in terms of formality. And this is something else I, I go over in the book, is that um, you can think of a God like, the form of self that all selves partake of. It's the form of, um, you might say, thing that all things partake of. It's what gives each thing its identity. It is the principle of uniqueness, the principle of individuation. It makes each thing to be what it is. So the necessary, it makes to be necessary. The physical, it makes to be physical. The um, Whatever it is, so long as it has identity, um, the God is what, what provides that identity and it does it by constituting it. So that's uh, earlier. I brought up the difference between Platonism and classical theism as a difference between a constitutive model of the first principle and a causal model. So for the Platonists, they think myriologically and they think of um, how all things are constituted. What is the ultimate form, so to speak, that all things participate in? Whereas the classical theist thinks in terms of causality what is the ultimate cause that everything else is an effect of, so to speak. Mm. Um, I hope that's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So then uh, I guess the question is going to be then, uh, do the gods sort of like mutually require their own, ex uh, require each other's existence in order to exist? Like, is it the case that, take Zeus, for example, that Zeus's existence uh, the fact that Zeus is, is an individual uh, God, that Zeus, his existence is part, like, in some sense, dependent upon the other gods, such as Hera or Ares or anything like that. Is, is, is that the case that each of these gods are sort of like mutually dependent in, I guess you can say like a spider web sort of way, or is it the case that they, they all exist uh, individually and they each have their own existence and they have no need, uh, no, their, their existence is in no way dependent upon each other's existence. Right. So that, that is the Copernican revolution that, um, was the light bulb moment for me was being able to conceptualize each God as the first principle so that none of them depend on one another. They manifest throughout nature in roles and mm -hmm. relationships, but in and of themselves, each of them is the one, so to speak. Uh, uh, what was his name? Oh, I'm blanking on his name. There's a, a Eusebius, a church historian. He talked about 
uh, Xenocrates, a Platonist, and he quotes him as saying that all the gods are supreme, like none of them is um, inferior, so to speak. So the, the dependence relations that we see in myths and um, you, you might hear of in pantheons, these are um, almost chosen roles of each god. They're the manifestations of their unique individuality. Um, so like I said, you could think of Poseidon, traditionally conceived of as the god of change. So Poseidon qua Poseidon, um, as that the, the all, that all things partake of, he, he makes each thing to be one um, insofar as they change, insofar as they resemble him in that respect. So he has this, this ineffable character, his who-ness, who he is, yeah. and all things partake of that. Um, just as all, all ones partake of the one, all things partake of Poseidon, like that. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if that's kind of answering no, the question. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely it is. Okay, yeah. Um, okay, so then, yeah, if each god is 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 themselves also a supreme, uh, I, I guess, a supreme individual. Um, yeah, so then, I, I guess a question I'll have is regarding the... I guess their roles that you say that they sort of uh, perform. Is it going to be the case that the gods each individually are omnipotent, or is it the case that each god it, their power is only specific to the roles that they have? So, uh, as you brought up Poseidon, uh, is it the case that the only thing that Poseidon can do is? bring about change within things in the world? Or is it the case that Poseidon can also ground stability within things in the world? Um, if it's the case that uh, no, only Zeus or some other god is that which can ground stability in the world, then it does seem like there's going to be some, I guess, limitations in regards to what certain gods can do and what they cannot do. And if there are limitations to these beings, then it seems like there's going to need to be some sort of, I guess, natures, which they have that, I guess, limit them. So yeah, that is just some thoughts there and curious as to how, what your thoughts are on, on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so divine functions, basically. Would you mind if I, I touched briefly on mythic literalism and then circle yeah. back? Oh, yeah, 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 that's good. Okay, so one of the popular impressions, not even uh, just in culture, but even at the most academic levels in philosophy of polytheism is... Um, kind of as a, a primitive, uh, silly view of gods. They're like these super creatures that live on mountains and, and do horrible things in the myths. And uh, I talk about this a lot on the blog and on Twitter and in conversation, but I think there's this thing called mythic literalism, which is where we, we look at these pagan myths, and for whatever reason, we, we take them literally. And we say, like, man, if Zeus was real, this is exactly how we'd be, you know. But when we like look at the Old Testament, for example, or the, the First Testament, however you want to say it, mm. you, you know, we, we see these these um, anthropomorphic depictions of Yahweh, for example, and we understand that this is like figurative, this is allegorical, this is, you know, so I think the same thing applies for the gods too. So there's this there's this impression, even at the highest levels of philosophy, that for example, Thor is the god of thunder. That's just what he does. For whatever reason, he's like the thunder god. Um, and there are certainly polytheists out there who, um, don't necessarily read the myths literally, but they do base their understanding of the gods almost wholly off of the myths, uh, which is not a problem, but from a, a platonic perspective, mm -hmm. when you, when you're not thinking of a God mythically, when you're not thinking of a God experientially, when you're thinking of them philosophically, each God is the principle of individuation for all things. And the way that they individuate all things is by being that which things participate in to be themselves. They, they provide all things with identity. So just as beings uh, are characterized as such by participating in being, just as red things are red because they participate in redness, you might say. Ones are ones because they participate in oneness. And since the one is each god, each god... Um, functions like a form for all things. So um, Thor, for example, he's not just the god of thunder. 
um, Thor qua Thor uh, individuates all things. All things participate in him and his unique character, which is ineffable because it's a it's a person. It's not a, a property. Mm -hmm. So I can't I can't like describe it, for example. But I can um, say like things symbolize the gods because the gods are so divinely simple um, that the only way to really depict them is through symbols. Um, so Thor, for example, symbolized by thunder. Poseidon is symbolized by the sea. Uh, so, for example, with Poseidon, I said earlier that the, the Platonists talked about him as the god of change or that change um, is what Poseidon looks like in different levels of nature because remember we're, we're stratifying the whole so we start with the 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 totality the oneness let's say poseidon we'll, we'll start with him as you go in you see each level of of being is individuated by his unique um character mm -hmm. and, and so he's symbolized by by sea by change by that that's that's a symbol of his character. I can't really put it into better words than that. Same with um, Odin, Thor, um, all of them. Okay, gotcha. So it's not necessarily the case that like, whenever there's some sort of change that occurs in the world, we can like blame old Poseidon for that. It's just that, <laughs> that, 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 that aspect of the world is sort of like what we use to sort of understand the, the character, that, that person, that individual, that, we represent via change what we observe change occurring with yes. okay yeah yeah so then the general question then like is it the case that all of the gods are each omnipotent uh or is it the case that like um hmm. they all sh like together share omnipotence and that like through all of the gods working together they're they're they are able to accomplish all things or is it the case that um each God is limited or even the multitude of gods are limited in some respect. Uh, so each God qua herself is in that position of the one. And when she's in that position, the one, everything else is on the periphery of her, so to speak. So when Zeus is considered qua Zeus, all the other gods are in Zeus um, as powers, so to speak. So Zeus um, has the power to change things through Poseidon. Poseidon is in him as a power. Vice versa, um, when Zeus is in Poseidon, Poseidon has the power to stabilize things because that's like Zeusic, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, a good way to understand this um, is to reason from classical theism, actually. So now we're getting into what's called polycentricity. And the idea of polycentricity is that um, when you look at, at this whole, this, this structure of reality, there is a, a structure of plurality that iterates on each level. And you can call it monocentric or monadic. This is where a group or plurality of items or objects have one thing in common. Uh, they derive their, their plurality from one source. So mm -hmm. red things derive the, that feature from redness. Um, Physical things derive it from physicality, whatever you want to say, you know, we don't have to commit to particular forms, but this is the, this is the structure of formal plurality. It's monocentric. The thing is when you um, look more and more out into things, you get to the totality of all things. And when you get to that point, that structure of plurality is strongly logically impossible. It's a, it's a, strict contradiction to posit something outside of the totality of all things right. to unify them as a whole. So this is why the Platonists said that the unity of this totality is internal, it's not external. So what they had to do is come up with a, a new way of thinking about plurality. It's not a group of things that are participating in one thing that's outside of them. Um, so that, that's how you might word it from their perspective, this new kind of arrangement at the at the top layer of things this polycentricity but we can reason to this from the classical theists um, own premises so something i often accuse thomas aquinas of and and all the um scholastics really is that they don't um treat polytheism uh like it's a plurality of gods they start out like that they talk about well what if there's a plurality of gods but what they end up doing is treating of a plurality of finite things. Um, so 
for example, actually, I had this pulled up. I didn't know if we'd get to this, but yeah. this is really interesting. Uh, Aquinas, uh, my favorite of the scholastics, uh, he says uh, one, which is the principle of number, is not predicated of God, but only of material things. Hmm. This is in his um, the body of the argument is where he's arguing for monotheism. But he says that one as a principle of number does not apply to God. So he's not hmm. saying that there's only one numerical God. That's a whole other conversation. But essentially, the reason I brought him up is because he correctly reasons that when you get to this um, uppermost level of, of reality, you get utter uniqueness. And he talks about how God has to be identical to God's nature. So that yeah. what we're talking about is this, this unique individual that nobody else can be. Right. Um, but I think where his error is, is he thinks that this implies there's no other gods. But what he's really saying is there's only one of Yahweh, which polytheists agree. There's only one of Poseidon. There's only one of Zeus. There's only one of Odin. So this goes back to the book. I'm sure you remember that section where I argue that monotheism is kind of a confusion because it wants to it wants to um, refute polytheism, but it, it doesn't have the right. the wherewithal to do that. So, um, but back to my original point, I'm going to keep going off on this, but uh, <laughs> okay. if you have divine simplicity, like the scholastic posit, like Aquinas reasons to, um, and you treat polytheism fairly, so you treat each god like they're really gods, then what you have to say is, um, the only plurality that they could have is different from the plurality of nature. Okay. Um, so in, in natural things, the way you have pluralities, where you have groups, classes, um, the way you have um, genus and species, uh, you have a group that participates in one thing. They have it in common. It's outside of them. They participate mm -hmm. in it. It's like a causal relation almost. That can't apply to gods. Otherwise, we're not talking about gods because like the scholastics tell us, gods are divinely simple or a god is divinely simple. So to be fair to that concept, to really treat polytheism, you have to say that um, this plurality of gods, they don't, what, whatever they have in common, it's not something outside of them. It's not a property. It's not a nature. It's not a feature. They're all divinely simple, each one of them. So... Uh, I have this book um, by James Delossal. I think that's how he says his name. Oh, yeah, uh, Delossal. Yeah, yeah. Delossal, yeah. He says, all that is, God is all that is in God. All that is in God is God. So that's the idea here. If you have a plurality of divinely simple beings, all that is in them, they they are. So the only thing that they ha they can have in common is each other. They can't have properties. They can't have natures. They can't have, the only thing they can have is themselves whatever they have they are right that's so, the commonality that they have is they're yes. each a type of thing that has everything within themselves yes they uh, each every, contain they all things yeah they, yeah they, they yeah. this is the constitutive model of the first principle they each god contains all things in that kind of formal respect mm -hmm. you know? all uh, right so then here's a i guess a concern or maybe a dilemma of some sort that like if the, the gods have power over the world um, and, he, and no one god is any more powerful than any other one god uh, and especially given the fact that the gods have nothing in common uh, at least in regards to any, any sort of shared feature between them is it possible that the gods might disagree as to how they would wish things within the world to go and given that sort of disagreement, it would seem that one must be, I guess, more powerful than the other given certain situations. So like if we were to say that Ares wants this side to win and Apollo wants this side to win, I, I have no familiar with the gods, so I might be like mixing Pantheon somewhere. But um, and uh, and yet both and, and especially if they're like persons of some sort that they have interests uh, in regards to how they want things to go. And both of them are like trying to do the same, uh, trying to do two different things. And one of them fails. It would seem to signify, at least to me, that one of them was more powerful than the other. And from that, we should signify, we should just understand that they had some sort of greater ontology than the other. Um, 
I, I didn't properly like exactly word that the way I wanted to, because like this is sort of deriving from a common objection to certain forms of Trinitarianism, where like if you have three divine persons that each have different wills from one another, you could theoretically have differing uh, in what they will to occur. And if one of them wills something to occur that the other one doesn't will to occur, then one of them is going to have to win out on, over the other. And then you're going to have some failure of omnipotence somewhere between them. So that's sort of the, I guess, general concern as well for the gods as well. Sure. This, uh, the, that worry you articulate is actually one of the oldest worries articulated against polytheism. You'll find it in all the church fathers. You'll find it in the Quran. You'll find it everywhere. Thomas Aquinas, uh, St. John, uh, Damascus, all of them say it. If you have polytheism, you have quarrel, you have disunity through the world. Um, mm -hmm. and, and of course, one kind of cheeky two quote is to be like, well, if a plurality of persons can do it, a plurality of gods can too. But um, what it comes down to is the peculiar un unity of the gods. So just as the Trinitarian will say, well, there are three divine persons, but they're all one God. So they appeal to unity mm -hmm. to... Um, protect that plurality. They'll say things like parachorises, for example. Um, what the polytheists can say, at least the Platonist, uh, the view I'm representing today, uh, will say the gods are not um, all kind of running around the universe together in that sense. Though I can appeal to polycentricity, just as you can appeal to parachorises. Mm -hmm. and, and so each god is the principle of individuation. In ourself, they each are omnipotent, omniscient, um, all good. They're each um, perfectly themselves, so to speak. Uh, like I was saying earlier, with the from the scholastic reasoning, when you have a plurality of gods, um, the only thing they can have is each other, and the only way they can have each other is to be each other. And so, what this looks like is when one god is in that position of being the all. All the other gods are in that god. They're in that god as the center of their plurality. So um, it's not that the gods have different degrees of power or different areas of jurisdiction or different um, moral standards, for example. Each god is the principle of individuation. Um, but it's like looking at a sphere, a circle. The center is the the one that radiates unity to all things you know, being mm -hmm. intellect life soul matter so to speak the gods circle around the one as well um and so it depends on the position you're looking at them and um you can look at Pose poseidon qua poseidon or you can look at poseidon qua uh power of athena you can look at poseidon mm -hmm. insofar as he is in zeus odin um any deity so it's it's per perspectival basically i see so no matter which way that zeus might want to utilize poseidon to change something in the world to that's going to be exactly the same way in which poseidon is going to want to uh bring about that same sort of change is is like each god sort of has each other as their, I guess, powers over the world. And so any way one God might be acting is going to be exactly the same way that every other God would want that one to act. Is that maybe you, the way that it, it is? It is, a, it is a good way to talk about it, that harmony of the gods. Uh, they are, like Proclus says, they are, they are more united together than the forms are, but they're also more distinct than the, form, than the forms are. They're the most united things and then the most distinct things. Mm -hmm. um, so it's important to say that there can be incompatible goods on polytheism, just as what is good for the prey is not what is good for the predator and mm -hmm. vice versa. You can have incompatible goods. And so in Greek myth, for example, you'll have Zeus say things like, um, there is no God I hate more than Ares. And what the Platonists will think of when they interpret that is Zeus, his ineffable character manifests throughout reality as stability whereas aries manifests throughout reality as division so stability and division are completely opposed to each other that doesn't mean that one is bad or one is good it just means they're incompatible and right. so you you have within even pantheons um as gods manifest 
um, attention. And this manifests even on a ritual level in the cults and religions. You'll have certain religious practitioners that are forbidden from interacting with certain deities because the God that they are um, beholden to is incompatible with this God. Mm -hmm. And so there's, it, it's really interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Well, it is also interesting too to think about like the sort of psychological makeup of a society too. If there are some uh, groups of individuals that are sort of devoting their life to one particular God over like one sort of realm of reality and others are devoting their uh, focus and attention and their way of life to another uh, type of God. You could say, I think this was sort of Jung's point in regards to the psychology uh, of certain societies is that there's going to be psychological disunity between the two because as, as a society, they're going to have differing goal sets, basically, and always working in, tan uh, in contrast to each other. Whereas, uh, as, as he sort of like, probably coming from a very Christian sort of Western uh, centric sort of philosophy understood that a mono a monotheistic sort of uh, psychology is more integrated, I guess, where you can see all things working together uh, uh, under the sort of divine supervision of one specific individual divine person. But um, okay. So then the, the gods w won't, uh ever come in conflict with one another in regards to like what one wills for something to occur where and then the other what wills for the opposite to occur rather they they will be working in tandem with each other even if it is the case that the character of one god is going to be um i guess opposed in some sense to another guy based upon like how that will be i guess occurring within the world of um like you had brought up the case of yeah zeus and um Aries, I guess. Um, yeah, so yeah. So as um, reality tries to instantiate mm -hmm. uh, Poseidon's divine character, it, it, it matters it. It limits it. It gives it confinement, shape, determination. When it does that, that, that looks like change. That's where change comes from. Mm -hmm. And when reality does that with Zeus, it manifests as like stability, for example, in different ways. And so you have this sort of clash between gods um not that they're willing different things but that just as reality tries to um exemplify them participate mm -hmm. in them um you get contrary goods so to speak i see okay um, so and this is something you had brought up on twitter as well that you don't necessarily think of the gods as acting causally but more so in a sort of teleologically i guess in the sense that it's, the, the, the matter within the world tries to orient itself towards the gods. And so maybe that could be a way in which to make sense of how um, some, some, some the, the will of one God happens uh, over the will of the other guy, because it's not the case that one God wills for this to occur and the other wills for the opposite. Rather, it's the case that the matter itself is, I guess, deciding whether to worship uh, one God over the other. And maybe that's what's going to be, I guess, the difference maker, I guess. And it's not going to be within the gods that there's this clash, but rather within the decision uh, of things that are material, such as people, I guess. Yes. Uh, this might be a good segue. I'm, I'm really trying to like condense a lot in here. So <laughs> yeah, I yeah. apologize to the people who no, never heard this. Um, a couple things. One, let me just throw some shade real quick at monolatry okay. and, and henotheism. Uh, yeah. There's this manufactured position uh, in various fields, religious studies, um, biblical studies, they call it monolatry. It's this idea where you acknowledge there are many gods, but you only worship one mm -hmm. or, or henotheism, these kinds of positions. This is polytheism. Like I said at the start, polytheism is the proposition that there are many gods. Right. You, you might choose to worship one. You might choose to worship all of them. That's irrelevant to how many exist. Um, so mon monolatry, these kinds of Positions they're they're manufactured. I don't I don't buy them. Um, scholars invented that so you could buy their books. Uh, uh, and then the will. So coming back to this, um, you framed it interesting. You you talk about how the gods um, will reality to unfold. Basically, this is another distinction between Platonism and and classical theism, and one that I'm seeing kind of evaporate lately. But like I said, we have the constitutive, we have the causal, we have the Myriological, we have the, the um, cos cosmological, 
here's another difference. We have emanation, we have creation. So classical theists seem universally committed to something called creation, creatio ex nello. This is um, something you can find the scholastics go to um, very hard work to articulate. Um, the Platonists, uh, by contrast, were resolutely opposed to that idea. They said the first principle does not act. The first principle produces being simply by existing. And um, uh, Plotinus, for example, Proclus, they, they talked very adamantly about how the one cannot cause in this sense. It's before all that. Because you got to think like the principle of individuation is what individuates all things, everything. So even causality, mm -hmm. even, even teleology, all these things that have identity, they receive it from something prior logically. That's the one or oneness. That's the principle of individuation. So uh, the Platonists will say that the gods are so big, so to speak, they don't have, they don't make decisions. They say decisions are for creatures. That's when you, that's when you don't know. That's when you have things available mm -hmm. to you, but the gods are constitutive of all things. So they don't, they don't have decisions in that way. That's not to say they don't have will because mm -hmm. all things are participations of them. So what we call will is a participant of something of them. Um, right. But uh, this has an interesting implication for the problem of evil, right? Because um, the problem of evil runs almost exclusively off the idea that if there's a God, um, they would need a morally sufficient reason to permit the evil that we see, the suffering that we see. But gods don't make decisions. They don't permit things. They're constitutive. They're not like these, um, they're not like these creatures that kind of cruise around the universe that can stop a flood if they wanted to. They're, they're the whole, they're the all things. So the um, for evil for the Platonists is really interesting. And I can't wait until the day when um, Platonists kind of come back to the table uh, because on their view, uh, evil is inevitable. It's an inevitable part of the procession of being it has to arise at the level of matter. Um, that's just the, the logistics of the structure. Um, but that's another conversation. I guess I just wanted to point out that as far as will goes, as far as the decisions go, um, the gods are intrinsically um, transcendent of that. But on the flip side, because they constitute all things, uh, the gods can act in nature. They, they can have souls, they can have bodies because they constitute everything. Now, the, the point to remember is that uh, whatever manifestation they, they um, engage in or engage with, they're not reducible to that. So if a god appears to you in a dream, if a god incarnates, if a god does anything like that, they're not just that localized appearance. Because intrinsically, they're the one, they're the whole Mm -hmm. This is just their manifestation on a level of intellect, on a level of soul, on a level of body, whatever, you know. Right. So. Okay, so that that's interesting. Like, uh, I, I knew that, yeah, you, uh, your sort of understanding of uh, religious experiences is going to be directly coming from, yeah, the gods. Um, but you had brought up incarnation there as well. And I know that, I guess, within, I guess, Hindu uh, mythology uh, that you'll have, I guess, the avatars of the gods. And I'm not so sure if that's exactly like an incarnation per se, or maybe just sort of like an appearance of some sort of like visual phenomenal experience of like, this is what the God looks like, and then it can evaporate. So it's not really like taking on a, a new nature or anything like that. But uh, do you think that like, it is possible, I guess, for the gods to incarnate in the way that sort of like the Christians understand uh, Yahweh incarnating? Yes, I, I don't see any um, metaphysical issue with that. I, I can't see uh, any principled uh, reason why a particular incarnation would occur. You know, I can't reason from my first principles to that. But if something like that were to occur, I wouldn't be like, well, that's impossible. Gotcha. Um, and it's interesting to bring Christianity up. Uh, this will be a huge point for future generations of polytheists. Um, the work I'm doing right now is to sort of build sustainable structures for them so that when the next generation comes, they have um, a philosophy that they can work with and stuff. And, and down the road, they will inevitably engage with naturalists and Christianity and Islam and, and so forth. And one thing I know that they will encounter is 
okay, let's say there are all these gods. What do you do with Jesus? Like, how do you explain this, this huge event in history? Mm. And so that's something that um, I think there's always going to be more work to be done on. But something I like about polycentricity, the ability to conceptualize m multiple uppercase gods, is that I can read Yahweh saying, I alone created the, the heavens, the universe. Um, if you don't um, uh, basically submit to me, like you are um, in danger of going to hell, something like that, I can understand yeah. this as true in a polytheist yeah. context. Because I'm like, okay, Yahweh is the one, just like Poseidon is. And Qua yeah. one, he is constitutive of all things. He is, this is his cosmos. And in that cosmos, he can say these things. And it's true. Mm. um so yeah that yeah. yeah and it is interesting too like uh within the old testament like certain biblical scholars will point out that there does seem to be sort of like a uh legion i guess or not legion what is the exact uh, there's a sort of like collection of gods that are sort of working there with god like you see that somewhat in the uh opening of job how like god is it almost seems reminiscent of like zeus sort of being there amongst the other gods and mm -hmm. there's talk of like god sends out the sons of elohim to sort of do things and so yeah i can see how like it's integratable i guess within sort of like christianity uh in general um all right. I, I know we've been going for like an hour and 12 minutes. I'm sure <laughs> we probably want to get to some questions from people in the yeah. chat, but uh, oh, wait, and, and I'm sure, Caleb, if you have something to say uh, or, or questions as well. Yeah, let's probably go a few more minutes, like five more minutes and then do some questions. Yeah. Uh, there's there's so that many. Works. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> there are so many areas I want to talk about. Uh, one of them is uh, divine revelation. How do we understand that? How do we, how does a divinely simple individual reveal itself? Is it through images or is it through symbols? Uh, these are all things that the Platonists talked about at length. And I want to um, make that material available to thinkers so that they can read this and integrate it. And, um, but one thing I do want to say is I hate that I waited until an hour and 13 minutes to say this, but I do have very condensed um arguments for polytheism and against monotheism um my purpose here tonight was more to try to um give the big picture of this this polytheist system mm -hmm. um and it is uh something that you can spend your life doing like I'm, I'm a student of plato for example i'm not i'm not like an expert you know I, I will be doing this for my whole life but as far as people who want those those snapshots those those arguments they do exist i've got them um, I don't want this presentation to make you think like, wow, polytheism is crazy, you know, because um, this is just the platonic vision that I'm trying yeah. to articulate. And, and that's good, especially since for a lot of people, they have this sort of like naive understanding of polytheism from mm -hmm. watching Thor movies or something like that. So, <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I know that uh, Caleb does have a lot of atheists in his audience. So I'm curious if like uh, you, you have a specific argument uh, against naturalism or at least to sort of get you I guess maybe it would be similar to like your general argument for polytheism but I am uh, I don't know, there is going to be at least somewhat of a difference because like sometimes theists will make different arguments than polytheists so just curious yeah yeah so this is actually really interesting uh, Eric Steinhardt uh, his new book atheistic platonism uh, mm -hmm. either came out this month or is coming out this oh no it came out in December okay. yeah so he uh is arguing that Platonism is the best view on offer, and the best way to understand that is atheistically. So he'll he'll say a lot of what I just said about the structure of reality all the way to the one, but mm -hmm. he he will undoubtedly, and I haven't read it yet, but he will undoubtedly um, not regard the one as uh, in religious terms. So this is where I would go at uh, naturalism from, and and. I've, I've been having to anticipate naturalist objections for years now, and I haven't had any naturalists like interact with me. So I don't know what they're actually going to say, but um, I could talk about how polytheism is actually simpler than naturalism because it doesn't posit an additional kind of thing. It posits the ineffable and ineffability is not a kind by definition. Um, I think the way I would argue that though, with this generic naturalist who I know nothing about, I think I would try to say that, when you get to the totality of all things, when you've 
worked your way up that, that scale, you can no longer posit a monocentric plurality. There can't be anything outside of that totality to unify it. You have to do what the Platonists did and posit a polycentric plurality. And once you get that, um, I would just try to reason my way to, you've got these um, ones that all the ones participate in, and it makes sense to to regard them religiously. And it certainly makes sense to regard them in personal terms. Right. Just like the, the Thomist would say that their God is more personal than persons, that persons are shadows of, of being itself. The Platonist would say, we're talking about the one that you participate in to be yourself. We're talking about someone that's so individual, someone that's so unique. So um, I would say that Platonism is... I don't, I don't think it can be held um, by naturalists. So maybe I'll, I'll have to talk to Eric Steinhardt about that. Yeah, no, that would be a really interesting conversation. Uh, yeah, I, I actually had the opportunity to partially interview him for a friend of mine's channel. So like, yeah, that might be an interesting oh, cool. conversation between the two of you. Um, okay, so is the reason to think of the, the ones as um, very personal, mostly because of the fact that they um, they're not there's something almost like a proper noun in, in the sense that they nothing else could fit that I guess definition or, or fit that characteristic of them so so like generally <laughs> or I, I guess just based on, or is it just based upon the fact that we we, we can't um, fully define all of their characteristics in the same way that you could sort of like uh, uh, define or uh, lay out all the attributes that I have, but there's still going to be that underlying, I guess, individuality that I have that couldn't be, I guess, the in ineffable sort of aspect. So I don't know, just like lay out uh, or just sort of like uh, express how to get from ineffability to personal. Oh, okay. Yeah, I got you. Um, so, the reason I think we, we're talking about ineffability is because we're talking about something that transcends nature, transcends intelligibility. This is ineffability. And, and the way I, I get to personalness from that is to think of ineffability as indescribability. So like a proposition is a subject and a predicate. Um, when you consider the subject qua subject, um, aside from all predicates, you get this indescribable one, the subject, just pure subject. Um, this is like a, a sheer personal name. I don't have anything to say anything about you. I can just say you. This is like this personal engagement. And the Platonists talk about how when you get to this level of the one and their contemplation, you stop using your intellect. You're no longer um, thinking about someone. You're meeting mm -hmm. someone. There's a, mm -hmm. an acquaintance, a direct acquaintance, an encounter. Um, so, so yeah, I would say uh, that that's how I would understand ineffability to be the negative side of personalness right in indescribability for a subject and, right. and that's yeah and so for non-persons you could theoretically fully describe them in terms of their attributes or their their predicates i guess and yes so for something that cannot be described fully in terms of its predicates it's going to have to be a person okay um yeah uh, oh and, and the other thing I, I thought of like and you brought this up at the very beginning as well i guess another sort of argument against naturalism for something like polytheism is going to be religious experience and the polytheist has a, maybe a better way in which to account for all of the data rather than just a very specific set of like certain religious experiences that yes is. yes this is something that i i um it's a drum i've been beaten for a long time I feel like the, the polytheist explanation of religious experiences is the most straightforward because it just takes them at their word. You say that you're experiencing Yahweh. Okay, cool. You say you're experiencing Odin. You say that you're experiencing Poseidon. Um, polytheism can take these things at their word. It's, re it's the revisionary accounts that have to introduce auxiliary hypotheses to say like um, we have this um, capacity, this faculty that we've adapted for evolutionary purposes to um, be hypersensitive to, you know, persons, or, or you might say there's hallucination, you might, there's cultural, um, pre-theoretical infection, whatever you want to say, but polytheism can be like, no, like I'm going to take you at your word. And if there's a good reason to think otherwise, okay. But until then there is this plurality of religious objects. Mm -hmm. Um, and that it's not just religious experiences either. It's also religions. 
Um, because even if there were no religious experiences, we have a plurality of religions, which makes sense on polytheism. That's exactly what you'd expect as the gods manifest. Um, and so, yeah. 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 No, I mean, this was a great conversation. I, I don't know if like you were sort of expecting more of a debate or anything like that, but no, I, I was really just interested in wanting to get better understand the sort of the platonic polytheistic worldview. And so, yeah, so far I've been definitely uh, like uh, enjoying your book and, and also just being able to talk with you and getting to better understand it so that I'm less naive, I guess, in how I think about <laughs> the, the pagan sort of philosophies are coming well, up. I, I really enjoyed um, being able to, to talk and say these things out loud. I, I have so many of these conversations in my head and on paper, you know, so uh, I will get to a point where I'm like really good at articulating this, but unfortunately you've got me at the, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Run, so. <laughs> no, no, don't worry about it. And, and I will also recommend to anybody who liked what Stephen was saying and wants to get more of it, go to Crusade Against Ignorance's channel. He had an interview with uh, Micah Edmondson on there. So, yeah, it was a good conversation there. I appreciate it. Uh, All right. So uh, I'll field some of the questions that had come in. Um, you know, granted, some of the, I mean, just keep in mind, some of these are coming from different perspectives. So, um, what are the physics or biology that allows God or a God to function? Uh, so interpret that as you want. Yeah. So um, when I talk about a God, I'm talking philosophically. So I'm not talking about how they're depicted in myths or how they're understood through experience, but I'm saying I'm talking about them as performers of a role in the world philosophically. And that rule is the principle of individuation, the principle of uniqueness. So each God is that by which each thing is itself. They're the providers of identity, of oneness, of unity, of individuality, metaphysical individuality, however you want to say it. So I would say that the principle of individuation precedes everything else. There's nothing else that precedes it because insofar as there is a thing around in the first place, it will have identity. It will already be um, affected by the principle of individuation. So there's no physics or biology to that precedes a God to allow them to function. The, the principle of individuation, whether you regard it as religious or not, um, comes first. Um, now, insofar as a God manifests on a physical level, um, I, I wouldn't think that the physics or biology would be any different than any other body, you know, as far as their the laws of physics and biology are manifestations of them in the first place. You know, all things are. All right. And then this was an objection. Um, so the lesser gods or other gods are going to be contingent beings, contingent on God, the necessary being. So how would you respond to that? I have this um, cheeky way of responding sometimes when somebody like asserts something, I'm just like, nah. -uh. Because <laughs> yeah. like, because it's not really an argument. It's just like this statement, this um, assertion. Yeah. I, th I feel like, um, in light of some recent things I read, I feel like they're this person's maybe confessing what seems true to them. This is a confession. This is what seems true to them, but that does not seem true to me. And I would say, it's for all the reasons that I laid out. Maybe this was uh, posted earlier in the conversation before I got to that. But I think um, each god is necessary. E each god is more than necessary because necessity has identity. So each God makes the necessary to be necessary. Each God makes the contingent to be contingent, the temporal to be temporal. That precedes all things. You know, we're talking about God's here, you know. Yeah. And then this was in regards to like mythology or like the, the stories about different gods. So they're saying like, why think that they should be interpreted allegorically or if that was what you were suggesting. <laughs> Well, I think they're silly concepts and that they're actually what these gods actually believe to be. Yeah, so I think if I'm understanding correctly, there there certainly were, have been, are, will be people who conceive of the gods as they are mythically depicted. That's true. Just like there are people who interpret the Bible fundamentally, you know, literalistically. Same with the Quran. Same, there's always going to be groups of people like that. I can't account for them. I'm not accountable for them. Um, but what I can tell you is that um, there are good reasons to think of the gods in these philosophical terms. And in light of that, 
there are good reasons to interpret divine revelation symbolically rather than literally. Um, there is a Platonist, his name is Seleucius. He was a, a friend of Julian the Apostate. He wrote what's essentially a pagan catechism. It's called On the Gods in the World. And he devoted a good amount of space to explaining why the myths are myths. You know, sometimes I, I feel like we forget that literary genre. This is not historiography. This is myth. And uh, I would highly recommend reading Seleucus's work because uh, he goes over the, the different levels of, of myth and how to interpret them and, and why. Uh, but ultimately, I would say just for quick purposes that uh, we should interpret myths symbolically because we're talking about purely simple individuals. Um, we can't we can't take pictures of them. They have no properties to represent um, through things there. All we can do is symbolize them. That's that's a consequence of divine simplicity, which I think has been overlooked by monotheists. Hmm. And they were wondering if the gods, in your view, operate like on a social contract. Um, or how would that apply? Uh, the structure of the polycentric manifold, the structure of the gods as they manifest the the pantheons. <laughs> I don't think it's a result of a contract. It's not a process or an action. It's not, it's nothing like that. It's, um, it is the logic of individuals as their unique characters manifest at the level of being intellect, life, soul, and so forth. This is the structure that this is what it looks like. So to speak, when you have Poseidon and Zeus manifesting, this is what it looks like. It's not an agreement between them. This is just, you know, this is them. Now, I have a question. Um, so in your view, it sounded like you were saying that matter is uncreated or the material world is uncreated by the gods. And they're, is that correct? Uh, so the gods um, cause all things in the sense that they uh, constitute them. So I would say that um, just like the form of redness causes red things to be red so too do gods cause all things uh to be whatever they are because they, they they give them their identity each thing um so it's not that the gods don't it's not that the world is is over here and the gods are over here it's that um the reality emanates from the gods because it's it's the stratification of them I'm talking about the, the totality of all things um so yeah, it's emanation versus creation. But matter, um, matter is the end of the procession of being. So as a as a god's unique character unfolds down through all the layers from unity to intellect to soul to whatever, the very bottom layer is matter, and that is the 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 furthest a god's character can manifest before it's absolute nothing. It's like the logical conclusion of that. They call it the procession of being. The plainest. So is it that each of the gods, is it that matter equally emanates from all of the gods? Or is it that, you know, some of the matter emanates from one god and mm. some from another? Or like, how would that work? I would say all things emanate from each god. Insofar as each god is the one, uh, all things <laughs> proceed from each god in their own way. So all things proceed from Zeus, Zeusically. You might say all things proceed from Poseidon, Poseidonically. Um, each god is the first cause, the, the first principle of all things, but in her own way. It's her unique way of, of constituting all things. Um, Proclus talks about how each god is her own cosmos, her own universe, so to speak. So there's a kind of like overlapping, like in the emanation, like between the gods or? The, the Platonists talked about being as the consensus of the gods. Uh, it's what the gods look like from down here, so to speak. It's not like you have um, two gods standing next to each other, each emanating reality, and then it kind of forms its each god is emanating all things and you can look at it from different perspectives it's it's like perspectival if you if you turn it around you're looking at zeus if you turn it this way you're looking at hera 
it's it's one, but it's it just depends on how you're looking at it. If that makes sense. And then I think um, JB, he has a channel as well, is interested in having you on. If you're interested, we can connect you too, but I think he yeah. was interested. So. Yeah, he's good. Yeah, you were on his channel, Caleb. So Yeah, yeah. I was on it. But... I'm, always, I'm always down here. <laughs> yeah, cool. All right. Well, I think we're at a pretty good stopping point time-wise, but if you had anything else you wanted to, uh, to share to make sure you, you, know, you want the audience to know, um, I'll let you have those final words. Okay. Um, a couple things I would say. One, what I've tried to do tonight is present the Platonist vision of polytheism. To me, Platonism is like naturalism is to atheism. It's like it's the game in town, so to speak. Um, but I do want to say that not all polytheists are Platonists. In fact, most are not. Um, so I don't want to, for one second, um, try to uh, erase these other polytheists, they, they each have their own traditions. Um, so I would recommend uh, listening to them as well. One of the best books, by the way, I can re recommend for that is Edward Butler's uh, The Way of the Gods. This is fantastic. He goes through um, different polytheisms all over the world. And he talks about um, not only their their beliefs and their rituals and stuff, but their histories, the difficulties they faced, how they got erased. Um, how they're struggling to survive it's it is fantastic so i highly recommend that it kind of places polytheism in the world in a way that the west will never um, be likely to acknowledge and then uh, i recommend uh this introduction to proclus uh it's by i think i've pronounced this correctly but radak schlup proclus and introduction um for those who are looking to understand this late um platonic view this is a good introduction. It is an introduction, so um, I'm not endorsing everything in there, but I will say that Proclus is in the top five most preserved ancient authors, and he's also one of the least understood. Um, so I'm trying to um, popularize some of their ideas, make that material more available, but also I want to, like I said, um, direct people's attention to polytheism itself and not necessarily to Platonism, because I'm here, I could talk about Platonism all day, but at the end of the day, I want people to give polytheism another chance, because I don't think, I don't think it was ever refuted. I think it was just dismissed. Hmm. All right. Yeah, well, thank, yeah, thanks for coming on. This is an interesting discussion, and, and yeah, yeah, we appreciate you coming on. John, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Uh, I just wanted to ask him. So your Twitter handle is true underscore consinity, like C O N C I N N I T Y. I'm I'm curious, like, what is that supposed to mean? Okay, so consinity is this idea of like a harmonious organization when everything is firing on all cylinders. It's well put together, well established. My patron deity is Asclepius, the Greek god of healing. He's played a huge role in my life, and um, something I've kind of come to see him in is harmony, not just healing, but harmony. And he gave me this idea of consinity as a, as a man who uh, is put together intellectually, it, my family life and my career and my um, business, everything just really well put together. And I, I've come to see consinity as a virtue um, when everything is in harmony. And so that's kind of what I, I pursue is true consinity. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and end it there. I mean, thank everybody for watching and hope you have a great rest of your night. Thanks.